Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Good? Good? Thank you. Always. I felt like Mufasa right there. You might want to bring me down a little bit. (laughs) Got the bass. That's a little too much. (laughs) Good morning, family church. I am glad you are here. I am glad to be back for one. It is uh, great to be in the house this morning. I know we were out. Thank you for that wonderful uh, lackluster pity party. I'm just kidding. Last week, Kelsey and I, we took off to get away with the kids, and um, it was good, but it was also exhausting. It's weird that vacation is, you're supposed to relax, but you, you can't, especially with kids. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was a lot of fun, but I am glad to be in the house this morning. If this is your first time with us, uh, this is Family Church. If you are a non-believer or an atheist or you're on the fence, uh, I'm glad you're here. You're welcome. You belong before you believe. You don't need to uh, believe in Jesus just to come to church, but you are in the right place. And um, I pray that you keep coming here and join us in these, these conversations that we have. This is a dialogue, so do not be afraid. Uh, we're not Baptists, so don't be quiet, please, for the love of God. Talk back to me. Um, not that it's about that, but this is a conversation that we have about our Lord and Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, if you are joining us, we are in the middle of a series called Contend in the book of Jude. It's only 25 verses. And I know some of y'all, you're probably here and you, see, you hear me say that every week. That's because not everybody's here every week, so it's good to rehash. So I know sometimes... Uh, Like with Netflix and Hulu, we want to skip the intro, but there's some people that don't come here all the time, so they need to get the the stuff, you know, that you have been getting as well. But this is uh, episode five. We don't really know how long it's going. I don't really, you know, we're just taking our time. There's no rushing here. We're not focused on entertainment. We're focused on encounters with Jesus. Um, But in the book of Jude, uh, we learn that Jude is a, he calls himself a servant of Jesus. Now, Jude is the brother of James, thus he is Jesus' brother as well. But he is more honored to be known as a servant of Christ rather than a brother of Christ. Whereas nowadays, we're more in the mindset of, uh, if I know somebody, I'm going to say that I know somebody. That way I can get the benefits of knowing that somebody. But Jude humbled himself because, as the Bible tells us, that we must decrease so he can increase. It's not about us. It's not about me. Don't idolize me. Don't idolize idolize him. Don't idolize your favorite pastor. Not Philip Anthony Mitchell, not Stephen Furtick, not T.D. Jakes, not Mike Todd, nobody else. Don't idolize these men. Nobody. Jesus Christ, the audience of one. That's who I'm preaching to. Uh, You know what? Let's, let's, Let's pray. I feel rusty because I took the one week off and it feels like I took a whole year off. So uh, we're gonna have to shake the rust off a little bit. Oh. God, we, we, mm, he's here. We thank you for this opportunity, Father, to join in your presence. Lord, there's no agendas here. There's no platform here, God. We're just here to proclaim your truth and your word will not return void, but it will go out and it will plant seeds, God. That as our nation is turning around and things are shifting, God, let us not focus on men and the attributes of men and the trophies of men, but focus solely on you, Jesus, because time is running out. So wake us up, God, to the reverence of who you are, the reverence of your holy word, creating us a new heart and a new mind to be focused on learning the word, studying the word, being completely saturated in your glory, Father. God, we strike down every demonic spirit in the name of Jesus that tries to come against us, that tries to come against the families within this body, the spirits of pride and arrogance and and, and self-righteousness, God, the spirits of division and discord and and disappointment and, and destruction and depression, God. All of those have to flee in Jesus' name. They are not welcome on this holy ground. God, we ask you, just hijack this service. Holy Spirit, fill me with your fire to do this in my weakness. 
Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Help me do it. And in the mighty and the majestic and in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, everybody said, Amen. Amen. So if you're joining us now for the note takers, we're going to be in Jude chapter 1 because there's only one chapter. We're going to be going today through verses 14 and 16. Uh, We've got a lot of ground to cover today, and if you haven't been here and you haven't heard me preach and you think I'm only going to preach three verses, nope, that's just the jumping off point. So if you're more interested in going to Texas Roadhouse for the rolls or a steakhouse or whatever, uh, I don't know what to tell you. I hope you stay the entire time, but if you've got somewhere better to be, good luck telling that to Jesus. (laughs) Y'all laughing, but I'm serious. (laughs) I... uh, I told, Kelsey posted this quote, and I actually, I want to I wanna open up with that. And I don't know where she got it from. I don't even know where she went now. Uh, I don't know where she got it from, but she put it on Facebook. I said I was going to steal it, and I told you I was going to give credit because I don't like stealing things. But she posted that the two things we fear losing the most are certainty and comfort. And if the church is bred on a diet of self-help books that try to convince us that God's intention is to make our lives as smooth as possible, we will be suckers in a hostile world. If your whole goal is to come to church and get a little feel-good message, I'm sorry, this is not really the place for you. We're not here to feel good. We're here to feel holy. We're here to get consecrated. We're here to get hungry for God and seek him and pursue him. And proclaim his truth. Time is running out. Time is running out. I have the passion for the lost because time is running out. And it's easy in the American society to just trudge through each and every day with no goal in mind other than your own uh, ambitions and, 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 and selfish behavior in order that you can get a fancier house or a bigger boat or a bigger car and fill yourselves with materialism. Meanwhile, your entire spiritual state is just in a nasty mess. Come on. And in a wonderful time in the church, I saw um, a commentary that Amanda, that you sent, and I wanted to share this as well, that... Conflict in churches. (laughs) 39% of conflict in churches is over change. Uh, If you've been with us for a while, Pastor Philip has been the lead pastor for 40 years. He founded this church April 21st, 1985. I was born in 1990. Um, So I'm getting up there. My knees hurt, my back hurts but we're gonna get a heavenly body. Um, I, was, I was completely, I wouldn't say running from God, but if you're not chasing God, you're still running from God. So I wasn't completely in the world, but I was also not in church at all. I was, if you don't know this about me, I was in a line work career. I felt the call of God to give that up and come and do this, the last thing I ever wanted to do. I don't like talking. I know that's hard to tell when I get up here. I don't like talking. Uh, when you pass me and you say something and I don't say anything, I probably just didn't hear you Or a lot of times I just internalize and I think before I speak, uh, except for when we fight. (laughs) Hey, I'm a I'm a I'm a work in progress too. So 39% of conflict, this gets worse. 39% of conflict is over change. We're in the middle of a change, we're in the middle of a transition where he will be stepping into a different role, and I am fulfilling my calling in this. 12% of conflict in churches is over doctrine. That's three times less than people get mad about change. That's a problem. 8% is over politics. Change is somehow taking more precedence over our scripture, our doctrine, our theology. As long as things stay the same, we're good to go. The minute we start trying to make things different or make things better and introduce any type of change, suddenly everybody's losing their minds and they're peeing their pants and they're freaking out and they can't get on board. If, <laughs> is there anybody new in here if you're not afraid to raise your hands? <laughs> Have I worked with you? Maybe. I, you look really familiar, but I also can't see your face. Sorry, I, you know, I told you I'm rusty. We're going we're gonna to work it through together. <laughs> G, 
Jude, this, this is, oh, I'm just opening up with a lot of, lot of commentaries here. I promise we're, we're getting to the good stuff, but you got to lay the foundation. Is it all right if I take a little bit of time? I'll try to honor the clock today, but I got to take a little bit of time to lay this out. It will be worth it. Jude is an impassioned exhortation to a church that is being compromised. His concerns, while touching on doctrine, are foremost ethical in nature. Posing a threat to the Christian community is a self-indulgent group that spurns spiritual authority and arrogantly appropriates its own authority above God's. So we're learning in this letter the dangers and the realities of false prophets. And if you don't think there are any in this country or in the world, I've got news for you. Amen. There are false prophets. If there were not, Jesus would have been a liar. You cannot have a fake unless there's also the real deal. So there are false prophets. They are after you. As much as you want to follow them on Instagram and listen to them on social media and send money to their bank accounts all while they're telling you that if you do X, Y, Z for this year and you're on the fourth year of doing X, Y, Z and meanwhile they've got a new Mercedes Benz and three more Rolexes and you're still trying to put food on the table, that's a false prophet. They do not have your best interest in mind. They do not care about stepping on... I'm done with this. I'm over it. Time is out the window. Uh, so, yeah, they don't, they don't have any desire other than their own selfish gain. And the problem with that is they are clever. As I was talking to Diona or, yeah, this morning, the, the false prophets, they know how to cleverly weave their way and put in just a little bit of truth to sprinkle it. That way you won't know what you're getting is actually leading you to destruction. Think, think of it like... Uh, you go to cook a, a steak, and it's been in the freezer for a few months, and it's actually gone bad, but if you put enough seasoning on it, it won't taste as nasty to you. But as soon as you uh, uh, eat it, and you get down the road a little bit, and a couple hours later, you're going to feel like you just ate Taco Bell. Yes. So Jude, oh, that's a great segue, because Jude is using negative examples all throughout his letter, all throughout his book, in order to, uh, to show that in order to become a more mature disciple of Christ, you can't just know what God is for. You also need to know what God is against. And I know in a lot of churches now, we have this tendency to focus on either what we are completely for and, and, and uh, steer away from things we are against and circumnavigate sin and not talk about sin and not talk about disgusting things. Y'all, sin is gross. It is evil. It stinks. If you could see it in front of you, you would probably vomit from ex just how disgusting it truly is. And it has permeated every inch and every piece and part of humanity ever since the fall in the garden. That is why things are the way that they are. The earth was not created to be this way. It was created to be holy. We were supposed to have dominion over it and rule over it and rule over everything in the world. But instead, like man, we decided our way is better than God. We propped ourselves up over God and said, you really didn't think you, know, you didn't really mean what you said, and we listened to an outsider, and we set everything down to the path of destruction that we are on now. Too much, too quick? Hell was not made for humans. Hell was made for the demons. So if you have the assumption that, you know, why would a loving God send people to hell? You cannot have love without also having hate. And a lot of people don't want to realize that, that God hates things. You cannot be capable of fully loving something while not also holding the capacity to hate something. So God loves us, but he hates our sin. Amen. He loves you, he accepts you, but he hates your sin. He doesn't like your depression. He doesn't like your depravity. He doesn't like your lust. He doesn't like that you're addicted to things, that you're addicted to drugs, that you're addicted to pornography, that you're a lesbian. He doesn't like that you're gay. He doesn't like that the demons of the LGBTQ community, community and because it's they, them, which is what the demons refer to themselves as in the Bible, and they're waging a war on our identity, he doesn't like that. Come on. Now, for some people that would like to clip that up and put that up on the internet or sitting under here and hear me say something like that, you think I'm being harsh and being rough and thinking that I naturally just hate you because you've come to church and you've been burned by people in church because, hey, if you're, if you're gay, you're going to hell. Come on. 
Because you've heard that. I am not the judge. There is one judge, and his name is Jesus, and he sits on the throne alone. So man cannot condemn you. You are already called by God to get out of what you are in. So when these people want to condemn you and tell you that you're going to hell, that's why you get church hurt when really you're just people hurt, and then you use that as an excuse to exit the church, to exit the community, and you are one of the one that left the 99 where the wolves in sheep's clothing or the devil swoops you up and sinks his fangs into you, and you have neglected your identity in Christ. Do you see how it works? They want to disconnect you from who you truly are. And my job is to get us to pursue God, to chase after him and everything that he is, everything that he wants for us, to wake you up to who you are and what part of the kingdom that you belong in. The world is full of a bunch of nasty crap and the dominion of darkness that wants to wage war and drag you down into hell because that is where they are going. And misery loves company. So they hate you because you are made in the image of God and they want to bring you down into destruction with them. So Jude uses these negative examples to show us just what we are up against and the reality of the false prophets because you do need to know what God is for and what he's against because if you don't know either or if you don't know both, you will do both. That is why when you have the churches that refuse to acknowledge sin and talk about sin and you can just, hey, God loves you and we don't say anything about the stuff you're doing in the dark about how you're sitting in church in a different city with somebody (laughs) that's not your husband or your wife and you did something in the hotel room the night before. (laughs) Sin is a nasty thing. And the problem with that is churches are too (coughs) pathetic to call it out anymore because we're worried about our reputation. For those of you that have not heard me speak, I don't care what you think about me. I don't care that the language I use ruffles your feathers. I do not say it for the sake of just ruffling your feathers, but to wake you up. We live in a nasty world. And if I sit up here with pretty little language and talk about the floating little angels that look like fairies and make sure I'm wearing a suit and tie to appease you because you have an idea of what men are supposed to look like on a platform, when meanwhile, nowhere in this book does it say, hey, you need to dress in X, Y, Z in order to be heard and understood. God calls who he calls, whether you like it or not. And the problem is when you don't like it, you need to repent. Now, does that mean I am your cup of tea? Absolutely not. I don't have to be. I am for everyone, but I am not for everyone. And that's fine. If you don't like it, we have other churches listed on our homepage of our website. Colonial churches down the street, I've played drums there and served with them. Go there. Go somewhere that is biblical. Do not go somewhere where there is a rainbow flag outside the door. Anyways, <laughs> if you don't know what God is for and what he is against, you will do both. And the problem with that is, that is exactly what the Israelites did all throughout the Old Testament. And your kids should have been in kid church, but this is why God called them whores, because they were in a covenant with him, meanwhile being adulterous against him the entire time. And now we live in a time where there is the divide, that, well, no, I'm sorry, let me back up. There is a dividing line between God and evil. Yes. That line does not move. It has not moved, ever. God is holy, he does not like sin, he hates sin. Sin was not the intention, but in his loving grace, he still made us, knowing we would sin, knowing that he would have to send his son, who is also God, don't ask me to explain that, But he sent him to die for us, the lamb that was slain before the creation. It was all a part of the plan to reconcile us to him. And there is a dividing line between good and evil. But the problem is Satan, all throughout each generation, has moved the line in our minds closer to sin. 
saying that you can still live in this and do this, but you're still holy. Did God really mean that? How they twist scripture. Well, Jesus didn't say homosexuality is a sin. No, but he said a man shall leave his father and his mother and be married to a woman. There's no other identity. There's no other marriage. One man, one woman. Don't like it? Tough luck. The problem is that the, the, the forces of darkness have made us think that God is more accepting of our sin than he is. God is accepting of you, not your sin, period. That is why in your prayer time, you need to be asking him to wring out your sin. Don't hide it. He already sees it. Doesn't matter how many lights are off in the computer room at three o'clock in the morning. Doesn't matter how many pills you have hidden in the bathroom. Doesn't matter how many times you put the vodka in the water bottle so your wife doesn't know about it. God knows what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. So quit trying to hide it from him. Bring it to him and say, God, I am struggling with this, but I hate it. Get it out of me. It's disgusting. It's gross. Rip it out of me. Cut it off of me. Burn it. And in the short time, we have seen, great one to come back with, Jesus. In a short time in the last, say, 50, 60 years, we have watched same-sex attraction go from a diagnosed mental condition to a civil right. And a gender spectrum that's probably only a few more letters off from being the entire alphabet. If you want to identify as a dog, ladies, not your husband, but an actual dog... You can now identify as a dog. You can put tails, and this is happening in our schools now, okay? Right down here at Otis Mason. My daughter's in fourth grade. There's kids in first grade wearing tails. Shocked, why? Because we don't pay attention. Because you're too busy at your careers. Because you're too busy at your job. Because you're too busy trying to put food on the table to be involved in your kid's life and realize they have set this up to indoctrinate your children. The teachers, the school system has way more time with your kids than you do. Than you will have, unless you homeschool them. And and since we had, and I don't mean this in the way that it's probably going to get taken, but since we had to fight for equal rights so women could work, and they were like, yeah, that's great, good, I'm all for the equality, y'all could work. The problem with that is they ran with it, so now both people have to go and work and stay in a job, and no one is there to steward the home. So women can't really be the mothers that they're called to be. And men, you're not out of the gate yet because you're coming home and the first thing you want to do is kick your work boots off, grab, not a Bud Light anymore because we're not doing that. (laughs) Oh, did y'all forget? We're going to boycott them for five minutes and then when we get rid of the little soy boy thing, then we'll go back to them. No, you cut it off. See, the, the problem with that is they've moved that line. It went from a mental disorder to a civil right, and now you can get married. Do you know what the next goalpost is, if you're paying attention? Anybody? Having sex with kids. Yeah, it's gross. Yeah. Have you heard and seen how they're putting this stuff in books in schools, in elementary schools? Watch their TV shows. There's one on Netflix. It's like, I think, one of the Jurassic Park uh, TV shows or whatever on Netflix that has a gay couple in it. They put this in front. Cocoa Melon. They put it in front of your kids while you're not paying attention because you'd rather be scrolling Facebook than paying attention or reading the Bible to them and discipling them because, hey, I'm just tired and I need a minute. Come on. And that's okay for a time, but then it becomes every single day, that's all you do, and now your kids are running around in the demonic, and you're like, well, what happened? You, you didn't happen. We see this with the, the, (laughs) woo, the the wicked Barbie dolls. Did anybody hear about this one? With the porn website on the back? I don't, I don't work for this kind of business, but I can't imagine the amount of quality control that something like that has to go to. You're going to tell me that's an accident? Absolutely freaking not. That is completely on purpose. Don't believe me? You want to call me a conspiracy theorist? Get your head out of the sand. You don't do that accidentally. People check these things. 
And the other side of it is, what did we expect when we're giving kids toys that are called wicked? We play with it. We play with the demonic and we make it just a joke. And hey, I'm all for because Jesus made fun of them and mocked them. And Elijah made fun of them and mocked them. But we're not mocking them. We're mingling with them. Verse 14. It was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, look, the Lord, oh, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. If you came today and you looked ahead and you were excited about me bringing up Enoch and the book of Enoch, I have to disappoint you. Enoch is quoted, not endorsed. Paul quoted uh, philosophers that were not Christians. They didn't follow Jesus. What does this mean? There's truth outside of the Bible. That doesn't make it the complete truth. Only that is complete truth. Only the word of God is complete truth. Now, if you want to read the book of Enoch, pray about it first. And there will be some in there, some truth in there. Obviously, that's why he quoted this section, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, and God deemed it worthy enough, true enough to put it in his holy word. That does not mean the entire thing is true. There is not one single scholar that believes that Enoch from Adam wrote the book of Enoch. Now, Jude has brought this up because in their time, they may have had a different one than what we have access to. And he's bringing it to their attention because this is a language they would understand. Hence why when I use language that you understand. And some people don't like it. I don't care. <laughs> it is, oh, help me, Holy Spirit. A suede epigraphal, suede epigraphal, which means it is written under a false name. So this is, the problem is, <laughs> we get on TikTok, and we get on Facebook, and we get on Instagram, and we get on YouTube, and we see shorts about, oh, the book of Enoch this, and the book of Enoch that, and oh, they left it all out of the Bible, and it was written by men, inspired by God, yes. But we jump in, and we don't, we don't tr trust anything and search anything. As I tell you all the time, test the spirits, test the scriptures. Go home, listen to me, go home, and test it, make sure I didn't mess up. I'm human. It happens. It happened in one of these in the series. And I came back the next week to say something about it. Why? Because I like to be transparent and humble and humility, not puffed up and think everything that comes out of my mouth is completely right and completely correct. I will make mistakes. I will stutter. And sometimes the wrong thing comes out and you think you're saying the right thing. Forgive me. We're growing together. But it was written under a false name. And Jude, in this time, in this entire thing that he's warning us about, he's dealing with the antinomians, which is those without law. These are the false prophets that took the law and threw it out the window and decided we could do everything we want to do because they considered themselves not bound by the law. They figured that this is how easy uh, scripture gets twisted, that they taught since the gift of grace, God's grace that he gave you. Mercy is you not getting what you deserve. Grace is you getting what you don't deserve. So we get the gift of grace, not by our works, by his work, by Jesus' work. It's done, it's finished. There's nothing you can add to it. Nothing you can do for it other than to submit to him. Submit. We don't like that word. Why? Because we're stuck in pride. Right. Right. The only reason you're not submitting and not fully submitting is because of your pride. <laughs> so they thought that since they had the gift of grace and it is not earned, that they are not obligated to obey what God says to obey, especially when it came to their bodies. If you have joined us in this, I do not have time because we're in the first verse and I'm already halfway through my clock. 
Uh, go back and look. There's a lot of sexual immorality in here, and we see that in the church now, where we're, like I said earlier, with the gay and lesbians uh, jumping into pulpits and leading people astray, or jumping on social media and leading people astray because we're too coward to go home and look things up, and in 60 seconds, I see this all the time with the reels that Kelsey puts of myself and him, you get 60 seconds of a clip and you create your entire opinion and truth and fact and theology based on one clip out of context (laughs) because our attention span is just that short now we have fast food faith I prayed to God and it didn't come do you know when you plant an apple seed when do you see apples a couple weeks a couple hours Couple, uh, no, I mean, this is what we do in our prayer life. I, I planted the seed, God, saved my kid, and then five minutes later, oh, man, they're still dealing with it. Where's God? He doesn't exist. I tried that Jesus stuff. It doesn't work for me. You plant a seed, a seed, an apple seed, seven to ten years or more before you get apples. You keep going, and you keep knocking, and sometimes the prayers that you are praying that God has put in your heart, whoo, to plant that seed is not for you. It's for the future generations in order to have the fruit of that seed. You think of, oh, yes. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Mm, I feel it now. Woo. Who was it? Abraham planted a tamarisk tree. It takes 400 years to grow. What happened 400 years after Abraham was going? Man, y'all don't know the word. Come on. What is this? What happened? Somebody's flipping. What Exodus, Egypt, 400 years. He planted a tree that took 400 years to grow. And the only people that would get shade from it are his descendants 400 years later walking through the very land where he planted that seed. He didn't get to go uh, see the benefits of it. They did. So keep praying. Ask, seek, knock. A-S-K, ask, seek, knock. You don't stop. 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 Jesus talks about the woman who kept going to the judge until he got so annoyed that he finally granted it to her. You don't stop. Pray without ceasing. We don't see revival in America yet, but we don't stop. We don't see growth like we want to see. We don't stop. Perseverance, persistence. You don't quit. Endure to the end. That is how you hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Not, I read two verses today and then I went out and listened to Eminem and hey, you know, I don't even remember what I read, but I can quote rap God. Man, y'all Latin. So they did this because of their body. They didn't think they were bound to the law. And in the Old Testament, There was the temple. And in the temple, there was this place called the Holy of Holies, where God's presence dwelled. You couldn't go in there. Only the high high priest could go in there once a year and perform sacrifice and purification rites that God laid out. Sacrificing the animals didn't stop the sin. It didn't get forgiveness of the sin. It was a foreshadowing of the, uh, the crucifixion of Christ. So we have in the Old Testament, they go in there and it is separated by a veil, a barrier. This is not a thin little wedding veil. It is a thick curtain. You can't go in there. It's separated. Why? <laughs> it is a symbol When Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, God put the angels there with the flaming swords to keep you out. So the barrier of the holy holies is to show, the the symbolism of that is to show that you don't have that full access to God because of your sinful ways. Does that make sense? Y'all quiet this morning so I can't tell. So there's a barrier, you can't go in there. And we know in the Old Testament that God's eyes are too pure to look on evil, to look on sin. He tolerates no sin, none of it. Y'all think, well, I didn't murder someone, I just took an ice pack out of the store, you know, and and stole a couple Red Bulls. It's sin. Adultery, lust, division, 
discord, bitterness, resentment, pride. It's all the same disgusting nastiness to God. But in our minds, because we're men and we like to puff ourselves up and look better than our neighbor, we decide, well, I'm not doing what they're doing. And we hold it behind our back and point to them, meanwhile hiding this nasty thing that's eating us inside, creating a rotten tree within us and rotten fruit. And you're wondering why you're not bearing fruit because you're holding the seed that you need to get rid of. Come on. So we know that when Jesus came and died and was sacrificed for us and, and gave us his righteousness, we know now that when God looks at you, if you're in Christ, not inviting him into your heart, because that is not in the Bible, when you submit yourself and he, you follow him as Savior and Lord, not just Savior. He didn't die just to save you. He died so he would be Lord over you and you would submit to him. And when God looks at us now, he sees Jesus' righteousness. That's in 2 Corinthians that he, he, he made him who knew no sin to be, him, to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness. So they have the temple in the Old Testament. And in Ezekiel, we see after all of these years... They are neglecting God's presence. They got tired of God's presence. They decided Monday night football, Sunday afternoon football, was better than coming to church. They decided the Mike Tyson and Jake Paul fight was better than reading their Bible. Come on. They decided Eminem and Cardi B and Rihanna and Diddy and all of these other things that need to repent are better than putting on worship music. It's boring. I don't like that song. It doesn't get me the way that the world music does. I don't get hype like I do, like I get in the club or in the bars. And I'll come in, into church, and I'm not going to raise my hand because that's weird looking. I'm just going to grip the back of the seats. But if I go to a Zach Bryan concert or I go see Morgan Wallen, I'm going to be lifting my shirt up so everybody can see what I have and raising my arms in worship to a man. Come on. Neglecting your Savior of the worship that he alone is worthy of. Not your favorite country music star, not your favorite rock star, not Guns N' Roses, not Metallica, not Avenged Sevenfold. Nobody but Jesus Christ is worthy of worship. <laughs> and so the depressing thing is we see, I'm gonna have to hurry. I prepare way too much. <laughs> in Ezekiel, they stopped enjoying his presence so much and they're sinning, listen, in the temple. Sinning within the temple. The rainbow preachers with their fun little stash telling you that Jesus is not God, that he didn't say this, that he didn't say that, that, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions. No, it's not. You're just not reading it in context and understanding it because you could read this front to cover, but if you do not have the Holy Spirit guiding you and seeking God, you're never going to understand it. So they deny all of that. They are sinning within the church. And what does God do in Ezekiel? He removes his presence. Gone. Bye-bye. No more. Empty. Just like hell is going to be. Now the Israelites, when they followed God and submitted to God, they were great. You want to make America great? Quit idolizing Trump and thinking he's the one on the throne. Only Jesus is on the throne. Only Jesus is on the throne. Quit getting all hyped up about MAGA and coming against Kamala. And look how excited y'all get over politics. And I'm up here talking to you about your stinking provider that gives you eternal life. And I can't get nothing out of it. We love men. We love achievements. But when it comes to God, oh, yeah, that one makes me angry. God, we, we treat God like a mistress instead of a Messiah. We place nothing but just a little belief in him, hoping that that gets us out of hell. Newsflash. The demons believe, and they tremble. They do nothing with it. And you are blaspheming Jesus Christ just as much when you neglect his holy word and you focus more on politics and positions and people than on Jesus Christ. 
America will fall. And it will never be great again if you do not get up and get on your face and pray to God to send revival, to strip the sin out of your life, to make you more holy, to consecrate you towards him, to make you more righteous, to give you a first love back for him, to focus on his word, to stand on his word, to stand up for his word. Where are y'all at? Until you start standing up for God, we're doomed. That is why in Matthew 27, Jesus removed, or God removed his presence from the temple. And when Jesus dies in Matthew 27, it says he gave up his spirit, the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave it up, and immediately what happens is the veil is torn from top to bottom, 80 feet tall. Torn to shreds from the top to the bottom, showing you that power only comes from above. There's nothing man can do. There's nothing man can stand on. There's nothing nobody can take against you. What are y'all doing? There's nobody that's got power over your life except for Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And God showed us when Jesus died and rose again from the grave that the veil was torn, the barrier was removed. You are no longer separated from God. You don't have to go to a temple to have church. Now, I know y'all want to sit here and believe that, oh, I don't need church. I got Jesus. Me and Jesus are on good terms. Go read Hebrews. This is still supposed to happen. The reason why you think you don't need church is because the devil wants to get you removed to attack you. What do the wolves go after? Lone sheep. sheep. You are a sheep. I am a sheep. They're not smart animals. They're prone to wandering and biting each other and attacking each other and being nasty and gross. And God still leaves the 99. To find that one. That's, that's why when you start slipping into sin and the devil wants you to get isolated and hide your sin, God says, no, I'm still right here chasing after you. I'm still following you. All you got to do is turn around and come into my arms. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm going to have a praise party up here by myself. I don't need y'all. Let's have the pose. Yes! Thank God he saved me. Thank God he saved me. Thank God he saved me. Ah. Mm. We're going to have fun now. This is why in 1 Corinthians, <laughs> I get a little excited, y'all. You should try it sometime. <laughs> That's why in 1 Corinthians it says you are bought with a price. You are expensive to God. He shed his blood for you. All of you. All of you, the nasty you that you want to hide, that you're sitting here and you know exactly what I'm talking about because the Holy Spirit just bubbled it up right to the surface and you want to shove it back down and harden your heart against him. And he's like, no, when that altar call comes later, you get your butt up to there and you pray and you lay it down. Come on. You are bought. Oh, yes. You are bought with a price. And now your body is a temple. I'm going to come over here. Y'all sleeping. Your body, your body is the temple. And now the Holy Spirit, yeah, see? Why can't y'all be like that? Your body is the temple. The Holy Spirit is within your body. So God made it to where you no longer have to go to a place once a year to experience his presence. He made you the church. He made you the So you go out into the world and people encounter him through you. That is why you are a living sacrifice. Deny yourself, make yourself low, and you will be lifted up in due time. Uh 
Do not conform to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So you can go out into the world and conform the world to Christ. Enoch. (laughs) Enoch is quoting Jude is quoting Enoch, who's actually, this whole passage from Enoch is rooted in different sections of the Old Testament. Namely in uh, Deuteronomy 33.2, I think it was Moses' song, and again in Isaiah 66. Verse 15, for behold, I don't know if I gave this to them. I did. The Lord will come. What is that? Isaiah. I thought I was having a stroke. <laughs> for behold, the Lord will come in fire and his, char- oh, <laughs> and his chariots like the whirlwind to render. Oh, no. What is that? God gets mad. God gets, no way, God is that holy child, meek and mild, you know, just give me apple pie, American Christianity, God doesn't get mad, he just loves everybody, and he just, he doesn't raise his voice, he doesn't do anything, he is coming in fire, his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury, for by fire the Lord will enter into judgment, and by his sword with all flesh And those slain by the Lord shall be many. Ow. If you are here for revival night, you know that the parable of the sower shows us that 75% of people will reject Jesus. The greatest prophet, the greatest person, the greatest preacher to ever live. And he gives us the example that three out of four people will deny him. One, outright. Two, when life starts getting a little too tough. Because we like to be comfortable. We like to have the air just right. Don't make it too cold. Don't make it too hot. Meanwhile, they're cutting people's throats in a different country for you just having this book. And to y'all, it collects dust. I skip Leviticus. I skip Leviticus the genealogies. That's boring to me. If this book is boring to you, you're boring. Come on. Because you're reading it the wrong... Have you read this? Like, my God, literally. I mean, holy moly. Game of Thrones, the Lord of the Rings, they ain't got nothing on this. Nothing. Driving tent pegs through people's heads, stabbing people having sex through the back, pinning them to the floor. Oh, wait, we're in church. You're not supposed to talk about that stuff. It's in here. Incest is in here. Is it cool? No, but it's there. Does that mean it's accepted? No, but it's there. Why? Because God doesn't hide. You hide. God doesn't hide. He lays it all out. Here's the mess you're in. And guess what? The entire book, that's why I got the Jesus Bible, to show everything is about Jesus. You're not in there. Can you see bits of yourself? Yeah, because you're human. But the entire book is written about him, to point to him, to show all of us that we are the problem and he is the answer. Oh, God. All right, speed round. Verse 15. I'm not making it. I I could lie to y'all and be like, hey, I'm gonna finish in 13 minutes. I'm sorry. It's not gonna happen. Just preach. I'm, I, I'm not. I'm sorry to take up more time. Stop apologizing. Hey, if you need to leave for like work or whatever, just put a finger up so we know you're not mad at us and just walking out. And if you are, do it to play it off, baby. <laughs> We're 15. <laughs> I feel good. To execute. 
To ex I love y'all. Thank y'all for being here and enjoying this. This is fun. <laughs> to execute judgment. All right. Deep breath. Pay attention to the words. Y'all know I'm big on words. <laughs> to execute judgment on all and to convict all of the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Four times the word all is mentioned in this verse, showing that judgment is for all of us. Yeah, we can sit up here and scream about the false prophets. We're getting judged too. And for the people that proclaim his truth and the preachers, we get judged more harshly. That's why false prophets is an extremely dangerous thing for you. Jesus saves your soul, but I am in charge of it. Because what comes out of my mouth, you will build something off of. That is why I prepare so much to feed you, hoping that you write notes and you take it home and get fed off of it through the week. I put a lot into this because you mean a lot to me. Thank you. And the other side, and maybe it's a little selfish, but I'm not getting up there and being judged and your blood is on my hands. Not happening. I will say what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. If you want to hear something fun, I, go watch Netflix. He's showing us in here that nothing and no one is escaping judgment. Nobody. Not you, not your mom, not your grandma who was the greatest saint that ever lived and didn't utter a single bad word out of her mouth and did nothing wrong and the alcohol never touched her lips and I never smoked drugs, whatever. <laughs> Apparently you can smoke drugs. Nobody is escaping judgment. Nobody. Not your kids. Not your infants. Everyone is going to be judged. Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I'm just letting that sit. Because we think in churches, the pastor says something and then he's got to immediately back it up because we want to be entertained. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you do nothing else in here, nothing else out of this entire day, think about the state of your soul. And if there is anything that when I said that just immediately sprung up within you and was like, maybe I should deal with this, deal with it. When? Right the heck now. Amen. Not when I get home, not tomorrow. I know when we go to start a diet, well, I'm gonna start Monday. No, now. You deal with it now because you're not guaranteed. Enough. You could have a heart attack right now. The very, the very fact showing you that God loves you is you're still breathing as I'm talking to you. Your heart is still beating because he's still got something for you to do. Judgment for all. But the false prophets, they deny not that he will come, but only that he will judge. Because we want the weak Jesus. We want the weak Jesus. You know what? This is a later verse. Go to uh, 2 Thessalonians. I'm going to jump around. 2 Thessalonians. Y'all want to see how weak Jesus is? This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. 
for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. These false prophets that want to lead your soul astray and drag you to hell with them, God will deal with them. You cut them out of, their li- out of your life and quit paying attention to them, quit uh, associating with them. The Bible says to have nothing to do with them. Nothing. The best you can do, pray for them. That repentance finds them before judgment does. Amen. Other than that, do nothing. Don't enjoy their company. Don't say, well, I'm trying to lead them to Jesus. No, you pray that they get led to Jesus. That their hands, that their bodies be delivered to the hands of Satan so that their flesh may be crushed and their soul be saved. Don't like it? It's in here. Y'all like, oh, deliver to Satan? Yeah, that's in God's word. You should read it sometime. That sounded a lot more harsh than I meant. Verse 7, and to grant (laughs) relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. You ready for weak Jesus? Holy child, meek and mild. Put the nativity scene up at Christmas, Jesus. Worship baby Jesus. Eight pound, five ounce baby Jesus. When, not if, when, when, (laughs) when, not if, when, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Next verse. In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Mm. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among, among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. Is that scary for y'all? Come on, is that scary for y'all? Good. It shouldn't be. You're saved and sanctified by the living Jesus Christ. You will be glorified in him. You will be worshiping him for eternity, not weeping, wishing you were with him. And for the other side, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. You have no option whether you want to do it now or do it then. It doesn't matter. You're going to do it either way. So get on board. Come back to life. Wake up from death and get in Christ. Get Christ in you and wake up to who you are in Jesus and bow before him now before you have to do it in judgment. Do it in submission. Back to Jude. All, 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 all. Judgment is for all. Verse 15, please. Four times, all. Four times, ungodly. All in different ways. There is an adjective, all ungodly. There is a noun, the ungodly acts or the deeds. There is a verb committed in ungodly ways 
And the last noun, the ungodly sinners. This is showing complete um, spiritual breakdown. It shows that this has permeated every single aspect of their life. Their ungodliness has crept into every fiber of their being. Completely ungodly. And they will be set up for judgment. Because once you think that you are outside and free from the scrutiny of God, you will cut loose from his standards. And then God becomes the parent that counts to their kids and says, I'm gonna count to five, and if you don't stop doing that, you're gonna be grounded, or you're gonna get a spanking, one, two, uh, uh, and then nothing happens. God becomes the grumbling parent that counts and never corrects. Once you cease belief in the God that the Bible has revealed, you will start to make him in your image how you want him to be. That's what the false prophets did. They fabricated a God who was completely unconcerned with the Christian lifestyle that that led to a bold disregard for his standards and his authority. They think they will escape judgment. And then Jude, in verse 16, shows us how these people look. These are grumblers. That's annoying. Complainers. Always complaining. Grumblers. Annoying. This is the Israelites in Exodus, where three days after they walked in between giant walls of water on dry ground, they immediately saw a problem of not having any water. You just watched all of these miracles and signs and wonders and walked between water. And you think God is not going to provide for you in the wilderness where he told you to go. And what's funny is our natural response is the same stinking thing. But we look at the Israelites and like, y'all are dumb. Look what God did for you. Look at this. You did this. You saw that. You did this. But you're dumb. And we do the same exact thing constantly. We take Literally everything for granted. Our house, our health, your vision, the fact that you're breathing, the fact that you walked in here, or the fact that you rolled in here or limped in here, but you are alive and able to get in here. That way you can still put your face towards him and find him and seek him instead of him being completely judgmental and having no patience and casting you into death. After everything they saw, they were just like, oh no, he's not going to do it. And the result of that is God's judgment on them. Everybody 20 years old and up die in the wilderness. And they never see the promise of God. Because they're too focused on the conditions that they were in. The conditions that you are in are conditioning you for where you're supposed to go. You cannot walk into your next season, into the next stage of your life, while simultaneously holding on to the same crap that you have held for years and years and years and expecting a different outcome. That's called insanity. So when you find yourself in crappy conditions, realize that God is conditioning you and cutting things off from you because you've got something better coming for you. See, they thought... They thought it would have been better to return to Egypt. 
where they were in literal slavery, but they had comfort because they got accustomed to it. And we still do this today. The Christian life is not easy. Newsflash, great marketing. (laughs) Not fun. The minute you set your face to God, the entire world sets its face against you. It takes... (laughs) Don't say go ahead if you don't know the word I want to use. Courage. It takes courage. It takes a biological factor that only men have. How's that? Safe enough? One day I'm going to just cut loose. I'm not trying to be crass. I'm just trying to wake y'all up. Uh, but we do this. The Christian life gets hard and then we complain and we immediately want to go back to what we were in. Because the grass looks greener. No. It's got more manure on it. (laughs) That was the Holy Spirit. mm. But the world... mm. The world will set its face against you. And in this life, there will be trials. There will be tribulations. But Jesus himself said, take heart. I have already overcome the world. So the world cannot overcome you unless you let it. A ship in a storm doesn't sink until the water gets in. And some of y'all need to hear that you need to quit looking at the rain getting into the boat and just realize that you need to keep paddling and get out of the storm. We get so focused on the bad stuff happening and people like leaving and people disconnecting and the problems and them turning their face against us. And meanwhile, we don't realize we're so focused on the back and what's happening and how angry this makes us and how bitter this makes us. And we start walking the wrong freaking direction, looking at them going, wow, this is a problem. I wish they would just change instead of being like, God, I can't change it, but you can change me. I want to go this way. I want to go forward. I want to move further in my walk further in my faith, and I will keep praying for them, but I've got too much work to do. Y'all getting your work cut out today on them cameras. Chuck, good job, Chuck. Don't, don't jeopardize, I don't want to say this, don't jeopardize your eternal security by lowering your standards because of the opinion of man or the weight of the fight to be holy. Do not give it up. You will regret it. Amen. But struggle produces strength. (laughs) He flexed him back there. Struggle produces strength. You want to get muscles? You go to the gym and work out. You want to get faith? You get your face in that book. You get your face in that word. And you flex that muscle. When God tugs on you and says, go talk to that person, you go talk to that person. You don't think, well, no, not me, God. You got the wrong guy. You done messed up. I tried that. It don't work out too good. I don't know if you've read the Bible. You don't tell God no. He will still get his will in his way. You're going to have more bruises. Y'all, Jonah wouldn't have been in the whale if he would have just been like, okay, and went. (laughs) Grumblers, malcontents, fault finders. Fault finders. Something wrong with everything. Nobody likes to be around that person. (coughs) Ever. Because eventually you're not going to be happy being a Christian. Proverbs tells you in uh, 23, 17, do not envy sinners. 
Quit looking to the world that you have already left behind and move forward in your faith, knowing what you have and who awaits you in eternity. Last bit. Y'all ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? There you go. Following grumblers, malcontents. I'm losing my voice, so we're definitely having to hurry up. I'm going to hit puberty one day, y'all. You all right? Following their own sinful desires. I'll just read the whole thing, and then we're going to dig in real quick. Loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage, following their own. They're going back to their past, and Jesus is no longer their Messiah because they want to be their own master. You are not in charge of your life. You will not be in charge of your life. The reason why you're struggling and fighting is because you're still trying to maintain control that you don't have. Period. Men, you cannot be a Christian and have control. You submit to the authority of God, period. The rest, when you do that, falls into place. You want to know who the true head of your household is? Jesus. Then you, then your wife. What you giggling at? Loud mouthed, <laughs> but <laughs> it's in the verse, man. If you're convicted, Amen. y'all got a couch. That was my wife. I'm come sleep on y'all's couch tonight. All right, let's hurry up. We got, I'm hungry. <laughs> Loud mouthed boasters, they're arrogant in their sin. Not just that prideful ego, which I cannot stand ego. I hate arrogance. Like, y'all, no, you, like, I absolutely loathe, loathe entirely (laughs) arrogance. It's almost Christmas. We're going to be watching The Grinch. I hate it. I hate it. It's, oh, it's gross because it's sin. It's just nasty. It's just nasty. They boast about their sin, and these are the people that think that they have achieved that like enlightened Christianity. We're like, that's that. I don't need Jesus. I don't need church. I can just have Jesus out in my little camping tent, in my little hoopty. I don't know. You know, I, I've got Jesus, and God is love. I don't need any of that. Boasting that we don't have to do what God tells us to do. We made Him in our own image. He will break that idol down so fast. Favoritism to gain advantage. The false prophets, and you see it now, the apostles that are so stuck on getting their prophets off of you. Off of you. And off of other people, these people that say, I use this rag to preach in, send me $2,000 and this holy rag is going to bring, you know, something to your life. Yeah, (laughs) probably. And apparently hair because it keeps getting in my mouth. But their desire for influence leads them to that arrogance because they want to... hmm, They want to piggyback off of other people's success for their own success. They see someone else being successful or popular at what they're doing, or they have zeal or whatever and and passion, and they want to piggyback off of that in order to build themselves up, but not for the right reasons. They're not trying to do anything for Jesus. They're trying to build themselves up like their own little bodily tower of battle. And you got news coming right here. Jesus stooped to serve. Yes, he didn't prop himself up like we want to do. He stooped down. He grabbed a towel and washed his disciples' feet. Yeah. Woo. He humiliated.
humiliated himself. Y'all watch the crucifixion. You watch the passion of the Christ. He was naked. He didn't have something covering nothing. And his body was so disgustingly destroyed that you couldn't tell if he was a man or a woman. And he did that for you. He did that for you, for the sin that you're still dealing with, for the sin that you're going to deal with, so that for the sin that you're still trying to hide. Come on. All of it has already been beaten. It's already been erased. You've already got your eternal life. You just have to place your faith in Jesus Christ. But influence and status and popularity and profit and money and gain and all of that stuff that focus on the opinions of man instead of the omnipotence of the Messiah, that's what we want to focus on. That's what the false prophets want to focus on. And we slip into false ideologies. And in Mark, oh man, in Mark 8, 36, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever, listen, for whoever, mm, pay attention, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the son of man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. When you want to neglect your Christianity and neglect being a disciple and neglect reaching out and talking to someone, you are being ashamed of, your, of Jesus Christ. And he is ashamed of that. None of you have died for anyone. You have not hung on a rough piece of wood, but naked and been destroyed for anyone. And you're definitely not going to do it for the pedophile that's getting caught with 20,000 videos and images on four different hard drives. You're definitely not going to do it for Hitler. You're definitely not going to do it for Kamala Harris or Joe Biden. Oh, you will like that one. You're not going to do it for Trump. You're not going to do it for your stepmother that you can't stand. You're not going to do it for your wife that you keep arguing against. Maybe, depends on what day of the week it is. You're not going to do it for the school system and the people in charge of indoctrinating your kids. You're not going to do it for the people that murdered your family member. You're not going to do it for the person that abused you when you were a child. You're not going to do it for the person that was a drunk driver and killed your family members. But Jesus did. But Jesus did. But Jesus did. Just as much for you as he did for them. He didn't stoop away from it. He didn't turn his face from it. He took all sin on himself, no matter how nasty, how gross, and he wiped the slate clean. Jesus is coming. He is not weak. We saw that in Thessalonians and all the other scriptures. He's coming back with fire. He's not weak. He's not woke. He is coming. You need to be prepared. Lastly, quick promise. Galatians 2. Y'all come up. Run me off this stage. They'll be on the screen. You can sing and look at my notes. I'm deciding where I want to start. All right. <clears throat> okay, in this passage, Paul is dealing with a different kind of false prophet. So in here, there is the false prophets that are more focused on legalism and the law. They want people when they convert to Christianity to get circumcised, to abide by the old law and remain bound by the old law and the old covenant. Paul says we're not bound by that anymore. 
We don't need to do that anymore. God, Jesus, has circumcised us in his crucifixion, and he made us whole. Verse 4, he says, Yet because a false brother secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom, who slipped in to spy out our freedom, you are free. Walk in your freedom. You can get the lights. They slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. You are free, and they want you to abide by a different set of rules that they made or to abandon the rules completely, which is what we see in Jude. Either way, it leads you into slavery. You're either bound by the old law or now if you neglect it all, you're bound into slavery of sin because you think you can continue sinning and God will do nothing about it. Judgment is coming. Oh, I love this. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment. So old so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. They wanted circumcision. Jews' people wanted you to completely have a license for licentiousness and be bound into sin, thinking you could do anything and everything you wanted to do. Now, Paul, in some points, is gentle. He's tolerant. He's nice. But when it comes to the truth of the gospel, you do not You do not break. You do not bow. You do not yield. You do not stoop down. This is God's holy word. You stand on it. You stand up for it. And you decree it. You declare it. You do not bend. You do not break. You do not worry about man's opinion. Ever. 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 None of it. There is too much at stake. Entirely too much at stake. You're talking about Jesus' words, God's words, his reverence, his holiness. All of that is at stake when you want to twist any section of this book. I don't care if you don't like it. I don't care if you don't agree with it. It is God's matchless, reverent, holy word. There is nothing that comes against this ever. Not your opinion, not your mother's opinion, not your neighbor's opinion. This is God's word. And it is dang time that we stand up in it for this country. You want the country to come back, you stand up for the word of God. Jude is saying, for the sake of gain, the gospel must never be compromised. Listen, never compromise. Not for peace. Not for peace. Not for peace. You are told to be a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. Never compromise. Not for peace. Not in your household. Ladies that are in here without your husband because your husband thinks this is a bunch of crap and a bunch of hocus pocus. You do not bend. You do not yield. You plead the blood of Jesus over his eternal soul. Not for peace, not for unity, not for opinion, for nothing do you waver from this book. Ever. This church will be founded on the faith of these scriptures. You say we already started. No, we're starting fresh, focusing wholly on the holiness. Because it is the unadulterated, unrated, unfiltered, uncompromised, unashamed proclamation of the word of God that has been handed down by blood that saves us from eternal damnation.
Paul said, and from those who seemed to be influential. What they, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. They seemed, in, I love how sassy he is in this. They seemed influential, but they were nothing. The false prophets, they seem influential. They have a big church. They have a big Instagram. They have a big Facebook and a big YouTube. They seem influential, but they have nothing because God shows no partiality because false is false. Doesn't matter if it's a little bit or a lot. There is no favoritism with God. None, not one dot, not one iota, not on your heritage, not on your reputation, not on your looks, not on your position, not on your trophies and accomplishment. God has no favorites. But man looks at the outward appearance and God will judge you and evaluate you by your heart. And he is looking for those who are devoted to him. He has no favorites, but his favor rests on those who are devoted to him. And the false prophets are devoted to their destruction, and they want to take you with them. Amen. Let's pray. Y'all come out. Welcome back to Jude. you invade this place like never before. Father, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you instill within us that fire that we need, that fire of the Holy Ghost, that fire that burns within us like, like the, the, literally the fire shut up within our bones to where we cannot remain silent any longer. God, breathe your life into these dead bones. Wake these dead bones up, God. Charge these people with your fire. Send them out into the world to be holy disciples and lead people to Christ. God, I pray in Jesus' name that family church, this church, sparks a revival, not just in St. Augustine, not just in America, but in the nations of the world. We reach millions in Jesus' name. We turn the lost back to you simply by pursuing you with every fiber of our being. And Jesus, we pray, no weapon formed against us will ever prosper. It will form, but it will cower in the face of the mighty and the majestic and the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, your saints be awakened. Awaken your church, God. Awaken us within your hearts. Stir us up to get back into political offices. Stir us up to go back into schools, to go back into grocery stores, to go back downtown, to go into places where the darkness has strongholds and cast it down in Jesus' name because nothing can stand against the mighty name of Jesus. And God, we come against those and we break them down. We break the chains off of people in Jesus' name. We break bondage. We break depression. We break bitterness. We break alcoholism. We break addiction. We break lust. We break all of those chains holding people back. We break cowardice in Jesus' name. Father, fill us with your boldness. Fill us with your fire. Fill us with your words. Let us become more aware of who you are. Let us get back to being holy. Let us get back to focusing on your word. Let us get back to focusing on on you. Mm. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer, come now. Do not wait. Do not hold back. Do not worry. Who is looking around? If you're worried about judgment, let them judge you. Let them talk. You will be blessed because they slander you. Come forth. Get a word. Get prayer. If you want to pray for people, come and pray for people. Lay hands on your brothers and sisters. 
to those within the room that would rather do witchcraft against people, we cast you out in Jesus' name. You are not welcome here. If we find it out, I will kick you out myself. This is holy ground. You are not welcome. If you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit and you are far from God, come home. Come home. There is a better way to live. And every piece of the Bible, if you just apply it to your life, will benefit you. But ultimately, you will know and have a relationship with Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. In a moment, they're going to play one more song. It is very simple. And it will be short. But these words have been sung in heaven for all eternity. The angels bow down and sing it before the throne non-stop, day and night, night and day. It doesn't cease to end. It does not stop. And Jesus, God lets us know when we, mm, when we join in the song of heaven, he will let loose the throne of heaven. He will let loose the presence of heaven. So as we sing and proclaim his holiness today, join us, join the song, lift your voice, be unashamed and sing the same thing that they are singing in heaven. And we invite the Holy Spirit and his presence to come into this room, to fill us with fresh fire, to fill us with fresh anointing, to fill us with healing, to fill us with power, to proclaim your word, to pursue you, to have strength for you. God, make us weaker for you. Build our faith. Fortify our faith, God. We want you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.